Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilles. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with Adrian Tamina presenting his new graphic memoir, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist, in conversation with Leanne Shafton. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like this one, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. We're hosting five events a week right here on Zoom. And just like always, our event schedule will appear on the website at harvard.com and you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over these last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Adrian Tamina's comics have been anthologized in McSweeney's Best American Comics and Best American Non-Required Reading, and his graphic novel Shortcomings was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. His most recent book, Killing and Dying, appeared on numerous best of 2015 lists and was a New York Times graphic bestseller. Since 1999, Tamina has been a regular contribut contributor to The New Yorker. Leanne Shafton's book, Swimming Studies, won the 2012 National Book Critics Circles Award for Autobiography and was longlisted for the William Hill Sports Book of the Year 2012. Her most recent book is Guest Book, a collection of 33 ghost stories. She is the co-founder with photographer Jason Fulford of JNL Books, an internationally distributed not-for-profit imprint specializing in art and photography books, and she is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. Tonight, they'll be discussing Adrian's graphic memoir, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist, in which he looks back at the trajectory of his life in cartooning from childhood obsession to acclaimed career with his trademark humor and pathos. Alan Moore calls it the most honest and insightful portrait you will ever see of an industry that I can no longer bear to be associated <laughs> with. And Lisa Hanawalt says, Adrian's vulnerability and willingness to share the cringiest moments of his life, ranging from juicy to uproarious to deeply healing, are a reminder to be braver because what have you got to lose? And now I'm honored to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Adrian and Leanne. Thank you, Lauren. Hi, everybody. Um, let me set up. Sorry, I'm just going to fix my screen here. How you doing, Leanne? Good. That's better. Good you, Adrian, you look like you're in a men's room. I'm in, I'm in the one room of this rental house that has a lock on the door. Uh, <laughs> Got it. And, and it happens to have nice, uh, has one of those little halo lights up there. So it's, it's uh -huh. no harsh shadows. Lovely. Ring flash. Yes. Um, I am so happy to be talking to you about your amazing memoir. Can I call it that? Yes. Um, uh, I love how the form of memoir is changing and this is like one more, one more kind of like needle bump. Um, mm -hmm. Although there's a, no, there's a lot of like graphic novel memoirs, I have to say, but um, this, I kind of want to do a show of hands, but we can't do a show of hands to see how many people in the audience have read it. So I can I can talk about things in it, but let's, I'm just gonna let's talk spoil. About it. Let's just okay. go ahead and spoil. Yeah, um, like a fridge left open. Yeah. Um, so the book is, gosh, I mean, the first thing that struck me, uh, audience and Adrian, is um, the book is about you know, so many perceived slights, indignities, humiliations that occur to someone getting their work out there, someone doing their thing while, um, while in the sort of company of um, your heroes and other people who are doing incredibly well um, alongside you. And all I could think was, you are my Neil Gaiman. Like whenever <laughs> we do events together, there's this 
massive lineup out the door and down to the sort of no, airport no, no. for you. No, 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 and then no. there's like one person who's just sort of sort of asks me where the bathroom is. <laughs> and no, they're just, they're just, they're just, and I'm sitting there kind of, you know, this is before iPhones, this has gone on like forever. But um, for everyone in the audience, Adrian and I weirdly often are um, on do, doing events together or on tour together. Um, this is such an honor. I actually appear somewhere in the book. Yes, you got a sneak preview of it uh, earlier, <laughs> right? I, I, think yeah, I, so, I think I wanted you to see a little bit before it went to, to press. So it was a little bit of that, that strange little echo of, um, I know exactly what you're feeling because you are the, you are the gay man to, to my <laughs> name in it. The first um, time anyone's ever said that. <laughs> you are. Um, but I also wanted to talk about a bazillion other things in the book. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, I love also the, the time and care you put into its presentation, cover, yes. binding, moleskin, the, just the, the sort of um, vernacular of the moleskin notebook. Yes. Um, credit, so, credit to our friend Tracy Huron for that, for oh, making, it, making my insane idea in right. the middle of a pandemic become a reality. It, it wouldn't Tracy, happen. well done. Yes. I mean, drone well quarters is well done. Yes. Um, I mean, this was, I've got this guy beside me too, because I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but everything they do is so beautiful. I mean, I'm proud to call them my publishers too. So yes. thank you. Yes. You're amazing. Okay. So my first question is about, um, is about the title because I remember at around Christmas time you said, "Oh, I have a title, but I'm not gonna tell. It's I'm too superstitious. I'm not gonna tell you." Yeah. Um, a. Why were you superstitious? Had you been undecided? And B. Then we'll talk about Alan Silito. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. it's. I think I say I'm superstitious just to make it seem cooler. But the truth is, I have some mental problem with pronouncing the titles of my books and the names of characters that I've invented and titles of stories. So I'm always just like, my last book, uh, yeah, so in that one, and, and the new book. <laughs> uh, and a lot of times people try and get me to talk about characters. Like they'll say like, what about this character from uh, sh Shortcomings? And I'll say, yeah, I know the character. And, they'll, and I'll just go, keep going where I keep referring to him as that character or something like that. So uh, it wasn't so much like I thought something was gonna jinx it or that someone was gonna use the title or anything, but it was just that, it's very awkward for me to uh, <laughs> to say them out loud for some reason. That's so funny. I'm now gonna gonna refer to that event and running the what's it called? <laughs> yeah. oh, really, for a, a really long time, you run yeah kind well, of across. <laughs> right, right now, I can just keep calling it the new book, but in the future, I don't know what I'll do. So I did when I did notice the title. I did think, what a beautiful title, and. I loved the reference to the loneliness of being an illustrator, sitting at your drawing table, hours and hours, months and months, years and years, decades and decades. Yeah. And um, the long distance, obviously referring to like, this is your look, looking back at it and the, 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 the sort of career that you've successfully had. Um, but I also, I always remember that you love movies and I wondered if it was the movie that you remember the story from or was it the book or? Um, yeah, I think it was, I, you know, I, I read the story a long time ago, and then I think I saw the movie after that, and I think that might have made a little more of an impression on me. Um, I need to go back and read more of Silito's work, because I, I've, I've, as soon as I announced this title, all these people came out of the woodwork and said, oh, have you read this book? Or um, there's one, I think, a novel that people keep bringing up um, that I haven't read yet, so... I need to educate myself on that. Saturday one. night and Sunday morning. Yes, that's the one. Do you like it? I haven't read it, but I oh. own it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have told me that I'd like it, so yeah. I'll check it out. Let's read it. It's actually a lovely title too, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Um, so the other thing was, I wondered when I when I noticed the title, I thought, oh, the angry young men, because that was sort of the the group that mm -hmm. that um, these these British writers were referred to as, and I thought. That's kind of a fitting title for <laughs> you and yeah. Seth and Chester, maybe maybe Klaus. Like I don't know. I just thought, yeah, there's a, there is actually a thing, and and not and I. One of the things I loved about the book was 
seeing your anger and seeing the kind of nihilism and like when you are when you think you're ill just going like what like how come you, what do you like i just thought oh my oh, god yeah. man, this is amazing just oh yeah that was letting, that was one of the most that was one of the most shameful things for me to have to put in the book but i thought I like loved it. i'm so happy you did it just made it made your anger absolutely relatable absolutely wonderful absolutely i i could feel it and yeah yeah it is funny that it's the things that you're most ashamed of that often people um people like kind of velcro onto in it it really worked because that's again in that story that's this point where you can feel your uh, the unfairness feeling and the but i'm gonna yeah. call you guys the young men now i think none um, of us are young none but, of us are young anymore though <laughs> that's the problem yeah that's true but they're still called angry young men that's um, true. but can you talk about writing your anger i mean you said that was sort of shameful but what else was shameful or or actually first answer the first question right yeah Anger, yeah. Um, that's it's a uh, you know um, you know my wife fairly well, and uh, she would be a good person to speak to this. But that's uh, anger is an emotion that's hard hard for me to express. It's um, it's I'm always kind of tamped down, and kind of the affect that I have now is the affect that I'll have in the middle of a giant argument or something like that, which is infuriating to, to my wife, I think. Um, uh, and so those scenes, uh, and I think actually some people have said, why isn't there more of that? They, they think that um, I kind of gloss over that, that part. They think that like I cut away from the part where I like flipped out and I'm telling the, I'm here to tell you that, that there wasn't anything to really cut away from. I just sort of like, you know, froze or something like that at most. Um, and so those few moments where it really breaks through, um, like the one you referenced has to do with when I'm walking myself to the emergency room because my doctor thinks I'm having a heart attack and my mind really starts racing. And instead of being overcome with this feeling of like, well, life was beautiful while it lasted and I love my fellow man, I start looking at every person I see and I see like, like an overweight guy sitting at a bus stop eating, you know, junk food and smoking a cigarette or something. And I'm just filled with rage at him because he's going to get to go on living for some reason. And he's going to go home and play with his kids that night. And uh, I've lived a fairly healthy life. And somehow I'm the one who's about to die of a heart attack or something like that. So that, that was one part where that was one point in my life where the rage definitely came, came bubbling up, but even, even writing it in the comic, I felt, a little ashamed. I was like, I don't want people to know that I was kind of wishing death upon this nice guy. Oh, we, all, we all do that. <laughs> I, it's perfectly timed, Adrian. And it is, again, like, I see your rage bubble up. Like, I think there's rage in killing and dying. Oh, there's yeah. a lot of rage at, at sort of rejection and humiliation in the book. <laughs> yes, you kind of, you take it and you have poised through it and you sort of, but it wasn't, it was a really, a really interesting moment um i think it comes through in the work more than in any other place in my life to be honest i think even in the the fictional stories um i have these characters that i sort of present as like well this guy is a balding white football fan in somewhere in california so he's nothing like me and i can then have him go into these tirades or something like that that you know obviously came from some horrible part of my brain yeah it's x-ray vision They're yeah. The yeah yeah <laughs> um, I, okay, so I wondered, I wondered about, um, well, how, how much you get, well, two questions, sort of, my question seems to come in pairs. Are you getting humiliated lately? And are the, <laughs> are the same things? And then B, I wanted to ask you about the form of this book, because again, it's different and, and it does, it's not anything like, but it's a little bit more like, um, um, scenes from an impending marriage. Yeah. I wondered if you considered, um, maybe do this one first. I wondered if you considered this more or less experimental in terms of your work. And what do you consider experimental? That's or a good, kind that's, of a stretch for you? Yeah, that's a good question. I think this is not at all experimental in, in, in terms of form. I mean, it's, um, I, laid it out and drew it uh, in the simplest, most direct way possible. Just uh, the only thing on my mind was just communicating 
the, the, the story, not necessarily making it look beautiful or, or stylish or anything like that. But in terms of content for me, it was experimental. It was definitely a stretch for me um, because I, I, I started out doing kind of lightly autobiographical comics when I was much younger, but they were um, so generic and not revealing in any way. It would be like, I got a flat tire and when I changed the tire, I hurt my back, the end, you know, something like that. Um, and uh, so when I, you know, prior to this book, this new book, my, when I was working <laughs> on, my, on my previous book, um, it was uh, all fiction. It was like sh fictional short stories. Um, and I worked on that for a long time and I really just got in the, in the zone of using fiction as a way to really express myself. And I felt very comfortable with that. And I really started enjoying that, like especially writing darker stories that I think, um, like I'll say it, the title story, Killing and Dying was something like really kind of funneling all the anxieties and fears I had at that stage in my life, which was a new, a new parent um, and kind of putting it into a fictional story. And it just really worked for me. And I thought yeah. this is kind of the way I want to work. Um, but then when I finished the book, I didn't want to just do a repeat. I didn't want to do like another book of the exact same kind of short stories. Was so, it harder for you to write about yourself so directly? Um, it started out being a little paralyzing. When I decided that this was the project I was going to do, I started feeling very tensed up and, and, and constricted. Um, and a lot of it had to do with imagining how it would be received, how people what people would say to me in response to it. And so I intentionally did kind of a trick, a mental trick where at the last minute I decided not to tell our publisher about it. Um, I was about to kind of do like a pitch and say, can I get an advance on this? And can we set the deadline and everything like that? And then I said, no, I'm gonna just not do that. And I, and I held back on it and I worked on it um, till I was probably about halfway done with the book before I started mentioning it to people and, and before I even talked to Drawn and Quarterly about it. And that whole time I had, like I had a little note in my sketchbook that said something like, if this sucks, just throw it away. And it was sort of like, I was telling myself that it was just this kind of private experiment that, um, yeah. that maybe no one would ever see. And that was what sort of allowed me to get into some of the more embarrassing things. I think if I knew for sure that it was gonna be published, I wouldn't have drawn like the, um, the uh, lactose intolerance story, <laughs> anything like that. Um, I love that story too. And YouTube thanks. jokes. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, um, well, it's funny that you bring up killing and dying, and maybe I'll jump ahead I'm, um, to this question, which is, I, I found this book, your this this new book, this new book, yeah, titled new book, um, to be so funny and funny in that way of of the of the self-deprecating humor of this um of all of this sort of autobiographical self self-deprecating humor um i wondered if you were you know your generation's woody allen like i just oh. it's that kind of without all of the attendant um <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, i know just whatever but um great reference <laughs> i know i i cringed right before i said it and but then i said it but when, but you know the sort of, of humor I'm talking about. It's the shrug, it's the, it, there's mastery to the shrug and the sort of admission of one's, of, of one's humiliations in that. And you do it so, so beautifully. Killing and Dying, the title story in Killing and Dying, is about comedy too. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you could talk about your taste in comedy um, and your own, your own sort of delivery of, of things uh, that you find um, that you find funny because I, I find you now to now I think you've just mastered comedy in a completely <laughs> different way. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's that's a nice compliment because I feel like that was the other experiment with this book a little bit where I was, you know, in, in past books, I've had serious stories that had little jokes sprinkled throughout or, or little moments that were kind of supposed to be funny. But this was the first time where I thought like I was really sticking my neck out and kind of doing jokes and doing punchlines and, and, and things like that. So I was, I was nervous about that. Um, and I think the, the biggest influence 
for me in terms of that, um, strangely enough, actually is not a comedian, but is, is Sarah, my wife, because um, <laughs> when, we, uh, when we first met and she, she didn't know my work at all and she started reading it after she'd gotten to know me, and she just kind of had this like perplexed reaction to it. And she said like, you know, when we hang out, you're funny and you're cracking me up and you um, are interested, you, you love comedy as, as a viewer. And then you do these like kind of pretentious, serious books, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, I just was, you know, it, it really uh, affected me. She comes from uh, an, an Irish family, uh, Brooklyn, Long Island Irish family that uh, puts a huge premium on storytelling, on humor, um, sometimes at the expense of truth, but just get that laugh, make the story good. And, um, you know, there's a part of me from uh, starting with midway through shortcomings that in a way, everything I'm doing, I'm sort of trying to impress Sarah. I'm trying to get through to her a little bit and, and get a reaction from her. And, and so I think this was um, this was the, the strongest example of that yet. Where and especially because, uh, as you know, I don't have a studio. I work at a crappy little desk in the corner of the bedroom. And so she sees everything I do on a daily basis. And so for me, I think the the real goal with this book was um, I was trying to do one page a day, which is a new challenge for me too. Usually it's like five or seven days for a page. And so every day I would try and finish a page and I just kind of prayed that Sarah would come into the room at the end of the day and look at it and just maybe go like, huh, you know, uh, or something like that. And, yeah. and, and, that, and that felt like a, a success to me. I mean, she's- Sarah's laugh, Sarah has a good laugh. And so I could see how that would be satisfying. Yeah, yeah. I but also she, really yeah. love the story, sorry. Um, go ahead. I love when she appears um, in, in the stories too who wouldn't have asked her to marry them. After oh yeah, that. oh, that one. <laughs> the incident, because that didn't make it into scenes from impending marriage. Right. It's, a, it's an incredible story. And yeah. I, did, I just wanted to see the sort of road not taken where she goes up to the table. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have a request. I wanted to ask you to read something for your audience. Oh my God, okay. And I wanted to give you a choice. I suppose you could ignore my choices and do something of your own, but I thought um, choice A is to read the letter because oh. it's a completely different tone. Read the letter. I can't do in that. In manner of the man who is about to die. I can't do that. Okay. And then B, I thought you and I could do the dialogue from our scene. Let's do that. <laughs> I, you know, the thing about the letter that you're talking about, she's talking about a, a long letter that I write to my kids at the end of the book when I'm in a, hospital gurney. And the reason I wrote it and the reason I put it in the book is because is the same reason why I can't read it and why I can't say it out loud. <laughs> I need it in writing and I want them to, I want them to see it, but uh, you know, that was, that's, that's the way it's going to come to them. Um, well, I'm not going to make you read this one. Scene. Is there something else you want to read? No, that's fine. Let's, I, I would love to talk about your appearance in the book. And, and if you want to read some of that, we, we can, but we should tell people about, uh, yeah. Another thing that you're a master of, Adrian, that I'll tell people about is the inner monologue, right? So I want, I want to hear your, your sort of speaking voice and then the voice that you use for your inner monologue. <laughs> like whether it's that sort of like far away dreamy voice or whether it's like gravelly and it's, anyway. It's deep. It's like, a, it's like a low, it's like a low angry is voice. Nick Offerman? Is it the Nick Offerman voice? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I'm trying to find our, our story. Um, okay. Where is that? Uh, page 115. 115, okay. All right. Um, should we just, maybe we should just to expedite it, just explain to people what the, what the setup was. Um, I'm going to let you do that because you're the... Okay, well, this was according to this. It was in 20, 2016 um, when Leanne and I were scheduled to do an event at the Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge. And um, uh, so we went over there a little bit early and um, we had some time and decided to um, go get a bite next door at the restaurant that most people who are watching this know. Um, by the way, Leanne, because you suggested it. Um, Do you have fries? I am gonna. Uh, <laughs> 
Just need some French fries. <laughs> where's, the I, onion, I, where's the onion rings? I don't have the onion rings. I have like some pretzels. <laughs> a little onion ringy. Um, you're the best. Um, and anyway, we went there and had our French fries and onion rings. And um, at a certain point, I started noticing some people at another table paying attention to us. Um, so yeah. should we, should, should we um, I don't know, where do you want to read from page 116? I'm also curious as to how you read um, gra the gra the, the, your graphic novels. So I don't do it that often. This is kind of an exclusive. I, I... All right, I can, okay, let's start from 116. Um, and can I get an order of onion rings? I can't act, by the way. <laughs> Neither can I. Okay, okay. Go, I'll, do the, I'll do the external voices. And you do okay. you. Okay. okay. You got it. Uh, and now Leanne and I are sitting there eating and talking. And I say, um, do you think we should take audience? Uh, do you think we should take questions from the audience or? Sure, why not? Okay, here comes the, the thinking voice. That couple at the next table keep looking over here. They're probably coming to our event. I should watch what I say in case they're eavesdropping. I guess it was a dumb idea to eat at the place right next door to the bookstore. God, now they're glancing over here and whispering to each other. Could they be any less discreet? I guess we should probably head next door. Yeah. Oh God, the guy's getting up and coming over here. The woman looks mortified. Uh, hi, sorry to bug <laughs> you guys, but... Uh, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, we'll talk to you over at the event, okay? Huh? Uh, next door, we're doing a signing. I was just gonna ask if we could have the rest of those fries and onion rings. Um, if you're done with them. <laughs> All right, there it is. Uh, and now you could probably fact check me because I, I remember that there are a few distortions to that. I don't know if you recall, but that wasn't exactly, I streamlined it a little bit. Tell me how well, you streamlined I was such a coward that when I sensed the guy coming over, I left. I actually like walked over <laughs> to the front door and left you hanging there to deal with him. And you came over and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe those fans accosted you. And you were like, no, no, they just wanted our leftover food. <laughs> they were hungry. Yeah. <laughs> I do. It is. I mean, I was actually sort of impressed. Like how many times have you wanted to sort of just lean in and say, are you done with that? I mean, I just, well, yeah. I don't know if you're like me, but I don't have much of an appetite right before doing an event. So I think we ordered a bunch of stuff and kind of picked at it and just left it there. Exactly. And then I do love the little, the girlfriend looking more like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, it's so good. I'm just waiting and, and hoping that someone who's one of these characters in the book will somehow come across this. Like maybe that couple will eventually see this or the couple from the sushi restaurant in Brooklyn who, you know, yeah. The guy trashed my work while I was sitting next to him. You know, maybe yeah. maybe they'll see it. I don't know. I'm just hearing your internal monologue voice just then. Oh yeah. <laughs> I that. mean <laughs> let me okay. adjust. Another another um another question then. As this is, um I caught the end of your incredible lovely talk with Michael Sheen yesterday. Oh yeah. Who referred correctly to this as an origin story. Um in the superhero thing. I have two questions, one about comics and one about you. I'll do the comics one first and then maybe the end on the one about you. Um, in terms of comics, I mean, when, when we're comic book fans as kids, right, and we like the superhero ones and the Archies and the Richie Riches and whatever, um, what do you think that there's always a moment where you either go into, and I was trying to think of the correct word for sort of the underground indie comics, or you stay with the superhero ones. What is yeah. that gateway and when does it happen? And do you think it's something that's, that's sort of like a coming of age thing or like when did it happen for you and what were? Yeah, I think, I think there's a crucial turning point in a, in a comic book fan's life, maybe around, I mean, for me it happened around age 10 but sometime between 10 and 12 or something like that, I think you either, well, I'll tell you what happened for me first, which is that at age 10 or 11, I was on this weekly ritual and it's very OCD, like where every Saturday I would go to the same comic book store and I'd already filled out like a subscription list. So I didn't even have to like look for the comics I wanted. They had already plucked them out of the shelf and just were ready to hand it to me so that I could 
buy them. And um, I, at one point I realized that I did that and spent a bunch of my money and went home and kind of just really quickly, joylessly kind of flipped through them. And then I was all excited to get out the mylar and the, the bag and the sleeve and sort of put it in there and tape it up and file it alphabetically in this acid-free box. And kind of like I depict in the, in the book, I had this sort of like, you know, like ghost version of me floated up and was like, God, this is so pathetic and it's such a waste of money and it's such a waste of your life. Why are you doing this? You don't even enjoy it. You're like on this hamster wheel of, of this ritual. Um, and for me, I was just fortunate enough to, the, the, the comic store I went to had a, a section of like the underground alternative stuff. And so the next week I just sort of made a like 90 degree turn and like went into that formerly forbidden area. And um, thank God no one seemed to care or no one stopped me. And so that was when I discovered um, Love and Rockets and Peter Bag and Dan Klaus and all Why these people. Why do you think some people don't ever make that turn and stay with the superhero? Like what I, is that, what is that DNA or what is that thing that where it's either yeah. you take that road not take or you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think for my generation or at least my age group, it, it almost felt like I was an anomaly in that I, I made that little turn because a lot of people I knew and, you know, if you at that time when I was going to comic conventions and stuff and I was seeing people who were my age but were still interested in those same superhero things or whatever that, that we all liked when we were kids. And I, I, think it's, I think it's totally different now and I think that there's no one, one path or the other. You sort of grab something from over here and you grab something over here and it's, 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 there's no hierarchy and there's no um, separation from it. But um, for me, it, it just had to do with like a genuine lack of interest. It wasn't like I, th I thought I should be cooler or I, I, I felt ashamed or anything like that. It was just that I had concrete evidence that I'd lost interest because I wasn't even reading them anymore. It makes me think of that. I'm sure I've trotted out this quote to you before because I love it so much. There's like an the psychotherapist Adam Phillips says, um, our access is our, our keys to our own poverty or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And that idea of just like collecting, 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 and there's, got, you know, there's got to be something more. Well, okay, since you did take pivot and take that kind of road, my last question before we go to Q and A's is, had you not, uh -huh. and had you, had you gone down a different path, it's like that Halloween party that you couldn't come to that one time. <laughs> you oh, and, yeah. You couldn't come to the road not taken Halloween party. What is your road not taken, and what would the memoir have been? Like, how how do you think you would have been um, had you not turned into that little room in the comic book store and and started looking at those comics? Because those I, comics too, I I have to admit, when you start reading those comics, you do want to write. Like they are, like reading graphic novels. I, I feel like they're they're sort of by writers for writers to some yeah. degree yeah. writing so well i think i think no matter what i still would have lost interest in the the stuff <laughs> from my childhood i don't think there there is a path where i'd still be collecting thor now or something like that um <laughs> but i think the, the to answer your question i think that a lot of the appeal of this profession for me and why i went down this path in the first place was partially because i love the art form and i was a fan but also i love the life that it offered me and so I imagine that the alternate path would be some other job. And I've talked about this. I used to have this fantasy of working in a newspaper kiosk, like in the subway or on the street. And so I think that it would involve some other job that would still uh, involve me sitting alone <laughs> in a room, reading things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, only occasionally interacting with other humans when necessary. Um, so. I, I think that there would have been something where I would have had some analog to being a cartoonist. You know, I would have had to found another way to make money, but I think I still would have found some way to um, hide out from the world in, in a little <laughs> a little chamber. <laughs> yeah, that's making me think of what's the Seth title? It's a it's a it's good a, life if you don't weaken. You don't weaken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a good life if you don't weaken. Um, yeah. Adrian, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to. Lauren, so okay. do, you, do unless there's anything you want to cover that I uh, Well, in, in case we get cut off or run out of time, I just want to thank you, Leanne, and I want to tell everybody to go 
find Leanne's books. There's so many of them. They're so varied and they're so, um, <laughs> each one. <laughs> really, really. I mean, I don't even know. I guess guess book uh, is the most recent. So maybe that's the one to go check out. But um, uh, I just yeah. want to be on tour with you again, Adrian, so that while you sign all of your books and you have <laughs> I can like write another book. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we didn't even have time to get into it, but that thing at the Harvard bookstore also led to us being snowed in in Boston. Um, yeah. Snowstorm came, we couldn't get on our flight to the next stop, which was in Montreal. And you <laughs> saved the day because you have friends in every town and you can call people and you've been so sweet to them throughout your life that you can call in favors wherever you Drive are. Drive me and the stranger to Montreal. Yeah. Yes, and I got to ride on your coattails, so. That was fun. Yes, was we, we got in a car with, with someone I'd never met before, and he drove us through a snowstorm to <laughs> our event at Montreal, and we like ran out of the car onto the stage in Montreal just in time. So uh, without you there, I probably would have, I, I well, don't know, I, what, what would I have done? Gone back to New York or something? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I love doing these events with you. Thank you, Adrian. Love to Sarah and the girls. Yes, we'll we'll see each other in person soon, I hope. Okay, but here, we still got like this Q&A. Yeah, stuff let's do it. Laura. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to kick things off with this question from Christopher, who says, do you feel you treat your fictional characters and their actions with or without judgment? And do you apply the same treatment to yourself as a character? Hmm. Uh, with or without judgment. Um, I think yes about my fictional characters um, because I think approaching them from a position of judgment would sort of inhibit me from trying to craft them as, as three-dimensionally as possible. And it would sort of like point me in the direction of doing only perfectly likable characters or something like that. Um, on the other hand, I think with this current book, I am very judgmental of myself. And I think in a lot of ways, um, the book is a critique of, of myself more than anything else. Um, okay, this next question is from Jose, who says, what memoirs do you like not graphic novels? Oh, well, we should, we should get Leanne in on that one. Um, well, Leanne wrote a memoir that I liked. Do, do you see what we're... I just had a neighbor say that there's a slight smell of gas coming from our gas. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Okay. Anyway, sorry, what was the question? It's all under control. There's someone coming to look at it. Okay. We're, we were talking question? about what yeah, memoirs do we like, but not graphic novels. And I was going to talk about swimming stories to, to turn it back to you as, as a memoir, which um, you would think that Leanne's memoir would be a graphic novel, but it's not exactly a graphic novel. Um, so that, I, I think that qualifies for this answer. Um, anything that you that comes to your mind, Leanne? Well, um, uh, I'm weirdly I'm about to read um, I'm about to read a couple of um, wait it's not the John and Quarterly sent me some other memoirs I am trying to think of um, sorry I've caught, wait, I've caught she, she said not graphic novels though oh sorry right yeah no. yeah straight up memoirs. memoir um it's so funny because i actually really don't like that word mm -hmm. um joan diddy and i saw her in a talk at the public library where she she basically was just like what but sort of like it's sort of perfumey or something like that there has to be an autobiography sounds so drawn out weird too um memoirs i'm blanking a little bit i'm gonna think about it so go to okay. the next okay <laughs> okay We'll revisit. Um, okay, this is another question from Christopher, who says, you hinted in an earlier Q&A that you're collaborating on a project that may involve writing for the screen. Without necessarily <laughs> disclosing any details, what are you learning or have you learned about writing in a different medium than comics? Oh, okay, so someone is following us on, following me on tour here from one event to the next. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Christopher. Um, what have I learned uh, in a different meaning? Oh, um, well, uh, one thing that I learned was that um, I actually 
struggle with but enjoy doing um, work, doing writing, or uh, yeah, doing writing that isn't in comics form. And I think that was kind of a surprise to me because I'd spent so much of my life only thinking about comics and how to tell sto stories in that language. Um, and, uh, you know, so, sort of in, in, in concert with some of the stuff that I described towards the end of um, this book, um, I just had some opportunities to do this other kind of writing. And at least right now, it's, it's, really, um, it's really fun to have something that's so editable, you know, like I can sort of go in and change a character's name throughout a whole document or um, move things around in a way that's really kind of a pain in the neck when you're making comics. Um, and I also love the idea that just for once in my life, I can come up with an idea and then basically someone else has to execute it. I can say like, there's a giant crowd at a football stadium and, you know, or something like that. And I don't have to worry about sitting there and drawing it. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a nice reprieve, but, um, I should also say that at the end of the day that, um, there's always this relief when I look over from my computer and see my drawing board and remember that at any given moment, I can just scooch over there and create a story and I don't need to ask permission. I don't have to pitch it. I don't have to get funding. Um, and I can just do it for, for, for pennies, you know? And so I think that, um, no matter what, that will always be kind of like my, my home base for sure. Great. Um, okay. I'm going to ask this of both of you. This is from Michael. Um, how has cartooning, or I'm going to say working in general during the pandemic been different for you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I get more done actually. <laughs> like, Wait, what? I, I, well, I get more done. I've been working on, you know, because there's just, there's no socializing to do, which is. Well, see, I don't do any socializing anyway, so that didn't yeah, change for me. <laughs> Nothing's changed for you, has it, Adrian? Or well, what? except. Homeschooling's pretty, that, that involves, yeah. Yeah, so you, you've yeah, actually been it. more productive in the last four or five months, is what you're saying. A little bit, but listen, more productive on my own projects. I Still. mean, I'm, I'm definitely getting, I'm getting less, like, less, you know, work coming across the transom. But. Sure, sure. But still, you're, you're like existing as a creative person, which is like uh, kind of when I started doing these events for this tour, I had to sort of remind myself like, oh, yeah, I was once a person who made things, you know, artistically. And um, I'm supposed to talk about that. Too. This is your job. <laughs> I was well, but I didn't I didn't know that that homeschooling a, a, a kindergartner was going to be my job, you know. I, I, I would have liked a little more training in that before I was given that job. <laughs> um, so that's incredible. I, I didn't think you would have, I, I thought that was not going to be your answer, but because I've been incredibly less productive in the last four or five months. But you do have to see stuff like this as productive. It is part of the, this is sort of like, you know, drills or something. It's, I'm, it's I'm so grateful. Like I, the timing of this is, is great for me. Like if right now I was trying to actually finish the book and meet a deadline and you know, I'd be, I'd be losing my mind, but to sort of just be able to focus on homeschooling and things like that. And every once in a while, check my email and see what the status of the production of the book was or something like that. That was yeah. great. And, and something like this, you know, this is actually nice. Thing? Are you doing any crafty things with the girls? A little bit. I mean, I'm, you know, I just, I, I, I'm not one of those great parents. I look on Instagram and I see these parents who've turned like <laughs> egg crates into Smurfs and they're baking bread and stuff. And I feel like I'm just barely getting through the list of assignments for, for the day and, you know, just keeping oh. my kids away from watching uh, a TV show for a few more minutes to get some of the stuff done. You know, I'm not, no, no, not, not too crafty. Uh, okay, um, this next question is from Heather. How did you get connected with The New Yorker? You have a story in the new book where you're interested when you're just about to tell the story and I would love to hear it. <laughs> oh, is that right? There's something in the book where I get cut off? I can't even remember. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and be brief about it because I know we're running out of time, but um, the way- time. 
the way I got, I got okay, all right. The way I got connected with the New Yorker is only interesting in that every single element of the story is completely outdated and impossible to do in this day and age. So I was um, living in California at the time and I was in New York visiting a friend and just on a whim, I thought, you know, in my youthful arrogance, like I'll submit some samples to the New Yorker while I'm here. And so I got my friend's phone book and looked up the New Yorker in it and found the street address in the phone book and took a walk over to that building and actually just like took the elevator up and entered the New Yorker offices, um, which is now, you know, 10 layers of security and everything like that. And um, walked in and spoke to a receptionist and asked if I could leave a portfolio, which was actually just a, a, a glossy folder that I bought at a, at a office supply store. And it had my fax number written on the front of it because that's how illustrators were supposed to be contacted was by fax. <laughs> Oh, wow. and, and I left it there at the counter. And then um, I went back to California and eventually got a phone call from um, uh, a woman named Chris Curry, who was, uh, who Curry. is, yeah, she's, she's still a, a friend and, and an and a art director for me to this day. Um, and, and that was the beginning of it. I mean, it was several years later before I did anything for the cover, but um, the starting point was doing just little illustrations for the front of the magazine. And it came from wandering in off the street like that. Very cool. Okay, this is a good technical question from Hannah, who says, hi, Adrian, how large are your drawings and why? Are they one-to-one -one with what's printed or are they scaled down? And how well were you, were you able to stick to your goal of one page a day? Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, it really varies. Um, I just recently, finished um, an illustration for the New Yorker that was gonna print large, like it's like the cover and it involved a lot of perspective. And because of the way I do perspective, it was, if I did it any larger, I would have to like either buy a bigger drafting table or do some weird system so that I could have these vanishing points. And so to solve that, I just drew it the same size that it will actually print. and. It, it came out looking okay. I mean, it was I, maybe someone will notice that it's not as as sharp as as uh, other ones. But so sometimes I have done it. Um, I have another New Yorker cover from a long time ago that it involves people watching an outdoor movie under the Brooklyn Bridge. And um, for that one, I wanted for some reason I wanted to have a little bit more of a painterly, brushy kind of scrubby look. And so I actually drew that at about half the size of a New Yorker cover and enlarged it. Um, and every, most of the other times I draw things just uh, a little bit larger and, and reduce it. That's what, um, in, in the new book, uh, the pages are probably drawn, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 20% larger than, the, than they actually printed. But I guess the, the point that I'm trying to make is, is it doesn't really matter. There's no right or wrong way. And I've kind of tried out everything and it's just, um, you know, it's sort of whatever works for, for you. Um, and to your second question, Hannah, um, how well were you able to stick to your goal of one page a day? Uh, probably 50, 50, I, I'd say, uh, be better than I expected, especially since in the past I'd spent like a week on a single page. Um, but if I got like five pages done in a week, um, I felt pretty proud of myself. Um, and yeah, so that it was, it wasn't exactly one page a day, but, but close to it. Great. Uh, okay. Um, somebody wants to know, um, did you give those people your fries and onion rings? <laughs> oh yeah. What happened? <laughs> what happened, Leanne, when they, when they accosted Can you? Can you imagine if I didn't? I mean, <laughs> no. Throw them in the trash. <laughs> Just like shoved them in my mouth and walked away. <laughs> yes, we gave. Yes, we gave them. Yes, That's I good. do. I do like this question that's coming up um, about obscure cartoonists. Where's that? I didn't see. Ooh, that. yeah, I'll ask that one next. I have, okay. And I can say also, having frequented that place, they give you like way too many fries and onions. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> wild. Um, 
Okay, so this is from Jose, but I believe a different Jose than before, who hmm. said, what rather obscure cartoonist do you like or do you feel you discovered? And I'll ask that of both of you. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Liam. Oh, well, I've been, I, I kind of noticed this because I've been looking at, um, Adrian, do you follow Desert Island Comics? Mm -hmm. They've been doing this, this um, thing called Rescue Party where they mm -hmm. have, um, uh, cartoonists and, and graphic novelists and artists um, contribute sort of a, a panel and they are blowing my mind. They're yeah. so beautiful and they're so good. I haven't heard of hardly any of the artists yeah. and I just, I'm so excited and it makes me love Desert Island Comics so much. And please, um, Sean, uh, oh wait, no, not Sean, that wasn't your question. Um, uh, Jose. Uh, it was Jose, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, Desert Island Comics Rescue Party. I'm just noticing so much good work that I can't even keep up. It's yeah, so that's, a, that's a really good answer because I think, same with me, a lot of them were names that I'd never heard before. Um, I'm, it seems like it's sort of getting an international uh, contributions from all over the world, which- Yeah, Desert Island Comics has always had an incredible sort of um, inflow of stuff from Korea, Japan. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I think uh, uh, particularly in North America, we're we're sort of uh, we've kind of got our blinders on a little bit in terms of what's going on in the rest of the world. Well, I mean, in general, obviously, but uh, uh, also with with comics, I think it, there's there's sort of this really set in stone notion that if it's not translated, it doesn't exist to me. You know, like if I can't read it, if it's not been translated for my consumption, I'm not going to make the effort. Um, and I think that's one of one of the things that I would actually give credit to the internet for in terms of, of expanding what's what's available to us. We're not limited to what publishers decide to, to put on the shelves for us. Um, yeah. I almost so, can't believe how well suited Instagram is for graphic novel um, transmission. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, there's so many that I could throw in on that. Um, but I will just quickly mention uh, a Japanese cartoonist named Tagawa, spelled T-A-G-A-W-A. -A -A. Um, and uh, I think most of, most of my friends, most cartoonists know this person's work and they're, they're fans of it. But it has, like I said, it's never been translated, I don't think, maybe a little bit, maybe a few stories and anthologies have been translated. But he's got like a massive, like this beautiful hardcover library. There are all these beautiful books that are in these elaborately designed slip cases. And they kind of look like, like funny animal comics, like Japanese kids comics. Um, but, um, oh, so, okay. Yeah, they're, they're, um, they're just, they're just gorgeous. I think, uh, there, there's some questionable, uh, political content to it. I think some of it might've been done during the war. Um, and, you know, I've never been actually able to read the words, but, uh, visually and in terms of design it's it's really incredible god wouldn't that be an incredible imprint um adrian just like all of these untranslated untranslated graphic novels yeah do something um i also wanted one of the questions that i kind of had half formulated was what in the graphic novel industry would you would you like to see happen i know say that, that, say that again what in the graphic novel industry or in the book publishing industry in general would you like to see happen? Oh God. Um, in, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm, I'm always on the let's get mainstream publishers to publish um, to understand how well John and Quarterly sort of does this stuff and to get them to, to get comfortable with publicizing, marketing a more graphic material. Mm -hmm. But I always sort of, I just, I love, I love hearing from people like you and Richard McGuire and and like uh, Leanna Fink. Just just wondering like what 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 would you want to see happen? And well, it's it's difficult. It's a little difficult to answer in a way because it feels like it, it, in my lifetime I've seen so many massive strides and and kind of evolutions within the comics industry that so many things that I once thought of as like my kind of uh, pie in the sky fantasy have come true, you know? So a lot of that is already like hard for me to believe has actually occurred in terms of just how comics are perceived in the culture, um, the economics behind it where you don't necessarily have to be like 
basically homeless or, or working some full-time other job, there's, there is a slim chance that you can make a little bit of money. And yeah. that has this great, I, I don't say that so much just because, you know, some, a few, a few people can get rich, but because there is a possibility of some kind of economic com compensation that it's opened the doors to just a much broader range of artists who in the past might have said like, well, that sounds like kind of a fun thing to try, but I can't, I can't gamble, gamble it. And I'm going to just, uh, go be a storyboard artist in Hollywood instead, because I know I'll make money. Um, yeah. uh, and, you know, I think the other thing, and I think this is just sort of broadly about publishing in general, is that I hope very relatively quickly, we start to see uh, a industry, like the people who are making the decisions and writing the checks that is more reflective of the audience. Um, you know, when you go to a comics festival now, especially like something like SPX or CAB or, or TCAF or something like that, and you look around and you see how the, the, the audience for comics, the fandom has just broadened in, in compared to what I knew when I was a kid. And I think that there are a lot of those fans who are budding artists themselves. And I think it would broadened be nice. Broadened in age, broadened in uh, like broadened how? All, in all ways, in all ways. I mean, when I was a kid going to comic conventions, it was little boys or middle-aged men, almost all white. And, you know, I think that's, in fact, that might even be like a minority now when you go to some of these comics festivals. And I think it's um, uh, important just to have people, like I said, who are in those positions of power who might be more receptive or understanding of work from a wider range of contributors. Yeah. Oh, I, well, I just thought of a name for the obscure, I don't think she's obscure, but do you, do you follow Polly Noor's work? No, I don't know her. N-O-R-P-O-L-L-Y, fantastic stuff. Anyway, okay. I'll look um, it up. Uh, oh, yeah. she draws those like the devil suit women. Yeah. Yes, she's yeah. incredible. Okay, <laughs> I'll look it up. Um, sorry, I just, um, my, but yeah, um, I, I, what other things have you seen, uh, uh, Adrian, you said you, in your lifetime that you saw happen that you're, you're cheered by? Um, industry. Well, uh, I think the fact that now, uh, you know, if I was just meeting, Sarah now or you know going to meet her parents for the first time I could just easily say like I make graphic novels and they'd say like oh okay that's that's all right you know I, I understand that and even 10 years ago it was like this kind of stammering thing about like you know it's it's like comic books but but they're not for kids they're, they're for adults but they're not like adult comics and you know all that all that kind of yeah. awkwardness um so something like that just the fact like I didn't even ever really like that term graphic novels or graphic novelists, but I'm totally happy you, to- you just, I can't, I'm surprised you don't just say writer. I could, but- Oh my God, you could. <laughs> I don't know, I can't, I can't bring writer. myself- <laughs> You're such a good writer. I can't even- <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I feel uh, envy and, and, and I feel happiness for the, the present day version of, of me when I was 20 or something. Um, meeting other people out in the world and having to explain what they do and and then being met with just like oh yeah okay graphic novelist yeah you know um that that seems that seems amazing to me yeah yeah well you've are done those, it again. are those birds that i hear birds are crickets yeah birds are crickets okay i'm like a bird <laughs> yeah. yeah crickets well in 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 wrapping up, Adrian, I'm just so impressed with this. I love it. Um, my daughter tried to steal my copy, Tommy. Um, she she could. It's it's. There's nothing. Uh, there's nothing too bad in it. She could probably look at it, right? Yeah. yeah she laugh at. She and thank you, Sarah, for encouraging <laughs> you to to commit your jokes to paper. <laughs> yeah. Well, so funny and heartbreaking. The bet, like my my. My taste in comedy is the heartbreaking funny. Me too. So, so good. Me too. Um, 
did we have anything to do to, to wrap up here or how, how are we doing? Yeah, I'm um, doing great. I think okay. I'm just going to thank you both okay. for this incredible conversation. Um, thank you out there, everyone, for spending your evening with us. Um, please learn more about this remarkable book and purchase The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist at Harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good weekend and stay safe. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Adrian. All right. Let's get together when we can. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>